I think I'll go ahead and make a slow beginning for our international uh, visitors. We have an Australian uh, custom of acknowledging countries that we'll start with and then a brief introduction to John Hattie, who doesn't need an introduction. And then we'll I'll quickly turn it over to John Hattie so I don't waste uh, his valuable, precious time to, in his presentation. So today we acknowledge and pay our respects to the first peoples, the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways. We thank them for their continued custodianship. We acknowledge and celebrate the continuation of a living culture that has a unique role in this region. We also acknowledge elders past and present and thank them for their wisdom and guidance as we walk in their footsteps. Now, uh, I could spend lots of time introducing John Taddy. If you go and look at, uh, if, if you Google him, uh, there's quite an amazing uh, collection of things. I like his title, Emeritus Laureate Professor John Taddy. Uh, very, very elegant, very good. Uh, John is probably most widely known these days for his visible learnings, but uh, he's actually done quite a bit of research in a huge variety of different ways. He's quite a competent uh, psychometrician and has uh, excellent quantitative skills. Uh, that was basically his PhD as a quantitative researcher. Uh, in an earlier stage, uh, John and I worked on, uh, on self-concept research and we've uh, done quite a bit of Book with that, and John has a very impressive uh, book that he put together where he pulled together all of his self concept research and looked at that. We've also looked to uh, work together in student evaluations of teaching, which sort of ties in with some of the visible learning in terms of uh, being a source of feedback, although that was primarily with uh, university teachers. John Hattie's probably the most internationally well-known educational researcher from Australia. Uh, uh, I, I know that one of the self-conferences uh, where he gave a keynote, we had to uh, have a separate auditorium to have enough uh, space for all the visitors from uh, Germany that wanted to uh, come and hear his presentation. So we're very privileged. Uh, before I actually turn it over to uh, John, I also want to uh, let you know that uh, our keynote series that we're having will be this time, the first Wednesday of every month, and we invite all of you to join us. We have a stellar group of, uh, of national and international uh, keynote speakers, and we'll be sending around the invitations for those as well. So without further ado, let me hand it over to John Hattie. Thank you very much, Herb, and I also acknowledge the custodians of the land I'm on, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I thank you for the honour of being the kickoff to your series of Wednesday, first of the month notions. And it was even better when you told me I could talk about anything I liked. I hope you don't regret that. So I am going to share my presentation. There we go. There we go. And uh, also, um, during the session, if any of you have any wonderings or comments or ponderings, um, if you could use the chat room or um, there in the room, if you could indicate to Herb or Ricky that you want to raise something, I'd rather have that during this session. And Ricky, if you could monitor the chat room for me, that would be really good because I don't have the chance of seeing it. So. Please interrupt because that would make it much more exciting for me. So I want to base my talk today around these two quotes. And the first relates to my whole career has been a mistake. It's been about error and it's been about seeing error, not knowing as an opportunity. Whereas in so many classrooms around the world that I went through and still happens in, around the world, error is seen as an embarrassment. And I'm at the stage of life now where I have grandchildren that are going to school and I watch and listen as they switch from that exciting three and four year olds who love wallowing in mistakes and learning to starting to realize that their job is to keep quiet. And if they don't know, to look like they know and hope they don't get chosen. 
And the second quote is chance meetings. And if I had to ever write a biography, heaven help me, anyone would be interested, it would be about the beauties of naivety. And that's a big theme that I want. And I want to put it around chance meetings. My first chance meeting, I was asked as a graduate student, would I like to attend sessions by Karl Popper? Probably one of the most, if not the most famous philosopher of science of the 20th century. He came to Dunedin in New Zealand where I was a student. Uh, yes, he was quite elderly at the time. So even though I'm, it dates me. And he ran a series of sessions and he was very, very influential. He um, read every one of his lectures from his notes and his very thick Viennese accent. And he was very, very skeptical about social science. But his fundamental argument was about error. It's about looking for explanations, looking for evidence to prove that what you're arguing is not correct. Now, that's not how most educators work. They work on the opposite assumption. They have a theory, they have a hypothesis, and they look around for evidence to confirm it. Whereas Popper argued that science progressed the opposite. And indeed, the whole notion of hypothesis testing that came out of the VNE schools was based on looking for alternative evidence. And that has driven me in my career right through. And I'm fascinated by some of my colleagues who continually look for evidence to support their arguments, and some who are constantly looking <clears throat> for evidence that they may be wrong. And that's one of the reasons that I like working with your team, constantly looking, this is not right. How do I look at it? How do I look at it at different angles? Can I find evidence? And so that was my very first really big chance meeting as a, as a graduate student with someone who really left an impression on me. My second was my supervisor, Rod McDonald, who Herb and I knew very well. And it was by pure, pure chance that he became my supervisor. I went to Ontario and they assigned me a supervisor and it was a horrific experience. And I went initially after about two weeks, I decided to leave. And the head of the department didn't want me to leave because I didn't realize at the time that I was um, a, a source of economy for him. And so he assigned me to another Australian. Now, if any of you know Rod McDonald's work, he is head and shoulders above me in psychometrics. I never understood what he saw in me, but he saw something in me I didn't see in myself. And I think that's the hallmark of a great teacher, when you see something in someone that they don't see in themselves. And he built up my skills and measurement, helped supervise my thesis on the concept of unidimensionality, and that was the start of my career, moving then to, for the first time to me, to Australia, uh, looking at this whole notion of measurement. My argument is that throughout my career, this has been the theme. And you can see a lot of parallels in Herb Marsh here. He asks, how do you use the best measurement, the best research design, the best statistics we can, to address interesting education questions. But life then, as Herb indicated, right through until 10 years ago, I was as a psychomagician, psychomagician, um, looking at lots of different and interesting questions. And I knew that if I just focused on those concepts, yes, I could have a career, but I wanted to spend my time putting them into action asking various questions. And yes, I served as the editor of the International Journey for many years and was the president of the International Test Commission that oversaw all the test groupings around the world. So it was a really, really fun life and I was very happy in that life. My third meeting. As a very young academic, I went to my second American Education Research Conference. And when you're a very young person, you know, you're, you're a bit mesmerized by the people that you're listening to. And there was this uh, seminar session, a symposium session on structural modeling in the early, very early days of it. And it was very exciting. And I was a bit late to the session, so I sat in the very back. And then not long after, this other clearly young academic like myself, quite a large man, came and sat beside me. And after about five or 10 minutes, I thought, 
this session is awful. Oh my gosh, this is so bad. How do I get out? I can't get past this guy beside me because I'll have to create a storm to do it. And for something happened. Well, I looked at him and he said, well, I said, I think I want to leave. This is awful. And he said, yeah, it's terrible, isn't it? And we both walked out together. And that's how I met Herb Marsh. Now, in your academic career, it's very, very hard to find a critic. We are continually looking for people who want to support our ideas. But someone who wants to question us, to want to go deeper, to want to say, nah, one of Herb's favourite words, that's not how it's going to work. And so for many years, we worked at a distance, even though Armidale wasn't far from Sydney, but Perth was further away. And we phoned each other many, many times, usually late in the evening, hence leading to one of my most infamous statements, which um, did not help my married life when I made a comment one day that, Herb, you're the only person who keeps me awake at night when I talk to you. Didn't go down well on the family, but besides that. And asking those tough questions, critiquing, going deeper. And I've treasured that in Herb as a colleague. And I don't think many of you realise how hard it is to find those people in your academic career. And the fact that we've been doing it for 40 to 50 years, I think has been one of the most dramatic things. A chance meeting based on error, not enjoying a session, trying to trip over someone and meeting a person that is absolutely sees errors as opportunities. And then I went into various dimensions all over the place. Common theme, what is the application of good measurement problems to interesting notions? And self-concept was the one Herb mentioned, but I got into by mistake again. When, when I went to Armidale, they said, look, you can be a measurement person, but you have to have a substantive area. And so I looked around for the messiest area I could find, and wow, self-concept certainly filled that bill. And it was a very good way of anchoring many of the measurement problems. But I don't want to go into detail about, about that today. I want to go to chance meeting four. When I became head of school out at Western Australia in my early 30s, the professor out there was this man called Michael Scriven. Michael is a quite remarkable man. His first book he wrote was on gas turbines. He's a physicist. He's a philosopher. But he spent his whole career in education. And he was out there in Perth. And he's a very interesting man, polymath in many ways. And he has sat on my shoulder for many, many years. And there he is. We had lunch with him a few weeks ago uh, at his house in, um, in, in uh, San Francisco. He's 94. He's still publishing. He's still working. We're still working together on various things. And again, he was that critic. He was the one who said, no, I don't think it works that way. Um, he really went into that kind of depth. He said, Look, correlations are not causation, John, but they can be. Now, that was a rock to my boat. I did not think of that. And he's worked through many of the ideas about correlation causation. When we worked together in, in America, he ran a class for me one day on my structural modeling, and I wanted to talk about causation. But he spent the whole talk class saying, no, causation, sometimes it's a lot easier than explanations. And there's some really profound thoughts there. And so he still stays as that person who sits on my shoulder and says, you've got to come up with explanations. You've got to come up with theories of the world that are subject to falsification, because that's what it's all about. He also got me interested in the National Board. And I want to use this as a bit of a, a jump off here for a moment. It was set up in the early 90s in the US, and it was based on assessing teachers whether they met a certain level of excellence and expertise. And then in some states, rewarding them financially and acknowledging them. But one of the rules of National Board was that the assessments could not be multiple choice. They could be not short answers. And in the early 90s, this was kind of a novel event to run a major large scale system on more open ended assessments. And when I moved to the University of North Carolina, they had the contract, $80 million a year for many years, to build those assessments. And I can tell you a dirty secret. In the first two or three years, two years, the scoring, the psychometric qualities of those measures 
was horrifically bad. If we go back to even simple alpha coefficient, they were in the 0.5s and 0.6s, indefensible, random numbers. And I remember the time we were sitting there and we met all the psychometricians in America used to come to Greensburg twice a year. We had this big forum about what we do about it. And the idea came up, which was one of those things that just dropped out of the blue. What if we worked backwards? What if we worked and came up with the scoring mechanism first and then devised the assessments and made sure the assessments paralleled what the scoring is, which is the absolute opposite what typically happens is you come up with the test measures and the tests, and then you worry about getting your scoring right. Suddenly, we could get open-ended assessments, coefficient alphas on the 0.9s and above. It was a dramatic turnaround. And it certainly led me to look at this whole notion of backward design and testing, starting from the scoring mechanism and working backwards. And I want to explore that. It also introduced me to this whole notion of expertise. And I really struggle with our profession of educators where we don't, we don't welcome expertise. We don't acknowledge it. We pay teachers by experience and age, not by expertise. And we say, oh, but you can't measure it. Yes, you can if you start backwards. And the National Board was a very successful model. Now, one of the projects we did for that was the validation of the National Board model. And so we went into the classroom of teachers who scored a standard error above the cut score and teachers who went a standard error below the cut score. And quite often we found teachers in the same school to try and neutralise some of the backgrounds. We had five or six hundred teachers in our sample and we spent three days in every one of those teachers' classrooms. We took observations, we interviewed kids, we took photographs and artefacts of the kids' work, we interviewed the teachers, we wrote scripts of the lesson plans. Oh my goodness, we collected a lot of data. We took it all back to North Carolina and we had independent people code the whole things. Now what we found is quite dramatic difference, no surprise, between those recognized as national board, our experts, and those recognized as experienced. And I remember presenting this to the national board at one point and we got to morning tea and I'd outline the design, I'd outline the statistics, the research, I'd outline this picture, but there was a problem. There were no difference on the test scores. And Dick Yager, who was chairing the meeting, said to me, I think we'll stop and have morning tea now. And he took me out the back room and said, John, you're just killing National Board. What if all the kid teachers are experts compared to the experienced teachers? But there's no difference on the test scores. I said, Dick, I hadn't finished what I was going to say. And he said very nicely, look, you've done enough damage for today. I don't think we'll let you continue. I said, I think you have to. So I did and said, look, here's the problem. When we analyze the test scores, the test scores are all based 90% plus of NAPLAN scores, no child left behind, all the test scores across the states are measuring content knowledge. This next graph was the one that appeared on the front page of the New York Times and various other publications. The fundamental difference between experts and novices is experts, 75% of what happens in their classroom is deep thinking, relational and transfer and 25% surface, and it's the exact opposite and experienced. And if the test scores measure majority, about 90% is surface, you'd never find expert teachers by using test scores because that's not the nature of what they teach. It's not the nature of what that measures. And so this is really, I think, a really important concept of my life is to be, let's be clear about that nature of expertise. It's a balance. It's a proportion of knowing lots and knowing how. Knowing that and knowing how, and knowing about the transfer. Now there's a conspiracy. As we showed in our later work, above average students prefer surface level learning. They prefer facts. They prefer lots of knowledge because that's the game they're good at. That's the winners. It's the kids below average who want us to shut up and hear them thinking and hear other kids thinking so that they can become deeper as well. And so it's that notion that I want to come to is about how do we get that proportion right? Whereas a lot of our discussions is either or, and you hear this all the time in the media and the politicians. Should it be facts? Should it be phonics? Should it be deep learning? I'm greedy. It's about both, and it's about that proportion. 
I'm doing an interesting project at the moment in your state, in New South Wales. I've been contracted by your Minister of Education who wants to change the career structure of teachers. Very bold statement that she wants to base it on expertise. And you all know what's happening in your state next month, and that may continue this project or not. And I said to the Minister and the Premier when I met him, we're walking on the graves of a thousand failures here. People who have tried to introduce expertise and excellence. It will not be easy. And so they allowed us to do something that was quite novel, that we learned particularly from COVID. And that's this new democracies notion. And I said, look, Minister, if you introduce it on 1st of January 2023, it will fail. Because we'll make one mistake and it'll be all over. The criticism is ginormous. He said, well, how do I do it? I said, well, let's start from the ground up. Let's build the policy with the teachers and the school leaders. So we went on 117 roundtables right around New South Wales, right through Sydney, and had these roundtables, three to four hours in many cases, where we put a case for change and an options plan. And many said, oh, but you're just doing consultation in the normal way. You're putting out what you're going to do, and then you're going to do it anyway. No. Then they said, but how can we comment on what you're going to do if we don't know what you're going to do? And we said, well, you're well, going to help us build it. And slowly, even that was done within four weeks, we worked with those 117 roundtables, over 50% of the schools in New South Wales represented it, to build a model taking into account the criticisms. And I can tell you, the criticisms were visceral. There is not a lot of support for introducing expertise. How do you measure it? Surely, if we're going to reward teachers to stay in classrooms, that's going to disrupt the pipeline into leadership. Why should the teacher get paid more than a school leader? But wait a moment. If the biggest source of variance in schools are the teachers, is it not unreasonable to think that a teacher could be paid as much as a school leader? Other professions do it. Happens in academia. Many professors are paid more than deans. Not that many, but it can happen. It happens in police, it happens in doctors, it happens in hospitals. And it's, it really is fascinating that the criticism of it is intense. But one who's not prepared to stop, we're about to release very soon a third paper where we react and put out all the criticisms that came up and a suggested way forward. And we're in the process now of identifying 20 to 50 schools that have opted in to this trial where we're going to evaluate and build the model. So it's quite fascinating that we're building a model from the ground up from the profession, which is contrary to how nearly all policy has been developed in Australia. And we are trying to get this notion of expertise. And if I have any one mission in my life, it is to introduce expertise back into the equation. My fifth chance meeting was with this man. None of you will know him because he's the Minister of Education in New Zealand in the year 2000, Trevor Mellor. And this was my start of moving into policy. He put out a contract sooner after I arrived in New Zealand to build the New Zealand Assessment Scheme. And it was for $4 million. And I looked at it and said, I could develop those tests for $5,000 and change. Why would you want to do that? And not being a fan of national testing, I said, well, I don't think it's worth doing. So we put in a non-compliant bid and we won it. And over time, it moved up to more like $30 million. And what I'm most proud of is that system is still used by over half the teachers in New Zealand because it's voluntary, 22 years after we've introduced it. I want to show you a bit about it because it illustrates some of the things I've been talking about. Now, some of you may have never heard of it. In fact, it's really fascinating in New Zealand. It's never appeared in the press. There's never been a lead table produced from it. There's never been a press inquiry about it. But as I say, it's been used initially in 90% of the schools in New Zealand, and it's drifting away now as the technology is getting old. But this new government and this new minister that was announced yesterday is quite keen to update it. And I've been quite keen for other places to use it. But no, the psychometricians don't think that way. And we created ASTL backwards. Let me explain. Let me show you the first half, which was the easy part that any psychometrician could do with their eyes closed. 
You go into it, you choose. I'm ahead of myself. So I said, let me pause. You go in it and you choose what aspects of the curriculum you're teaching. And we can draw right down to the specific aspects. You choose what you think the level of difficulty that your students are performing at. And as you're going to see, there's a feedback mechanism. And you choose how you're going to deliver it. And you also choose social and emotional aspects, which is a critical part of every assessment. Six items, but we're trying to get across that they need to be taught in context of the reading of the maths. And then the program goes away and it uses Wim van der Linden's um, linear programming methods to come up with the best set of items from its item data bank of about 10 to 10 to 15,000 items that maximizes all those lovely psychometric properties, maximizes the fit to the curriculum and to the challenge difficulty level of the items, make sure it doesn't use items that the kids have seen before, and so on. There's about 40 different things it's maximizing. In the early days, it took seven minutes. Now it takes less than 0.7 milliseconds. And the teachers can look at the tests. And Trevor Mallard said to me, well, they'll cheat if they can see the test. They'll teach to it. And I say, no, Minister, because they'll soon realize if they cheat, the only person they're cheating is themselves. All the sizzle was not on that half, even though it was exciting to do all that measurement stuff, and particularly in the early days of adaptive testing and multiple tiered adaptive testing, which we were the first to implement in a system, the linear program, et cetera. And I got really excited about all that stuff. What did the teachers and the kids and the parents get excited about? The reports. And this was our first report. It took us, we had two questions. When the user saw the report, did they interpret it correctly? And if they didn't, the report was wrong. Whereas the current notion is that we blame the teachers if they don't interpret it correctly. The second question is, was there a consequence? Was there an action, a thought, or something different? And that was a tough one. We also knew that if the teachers printed this report, printed this report, we'd failed, because we know that the printing then just goes into the, a file or a rubbish tin. It took us over 80 groups, focus groups, to get this report, passing those two questions. And you can see there in the curriculum functions, this teacher was, well, actually, this is a score, year four, five, six, seven, eight school. Um, they were looking at specifically number knowledge, number operations, and part whole relations. And you can see the blue, the red dial is their score. And the blue is the national norms. They're below average. Now, of course they say, but we're different. We have slow socioeconomic kids and person. Well, you can actually modify. And by clicking on certain boxes, it can modify that blue. And we want to make the message. It's not the national norms that's the issue here. It's your kids. And if you look in the middle there at the red boxes, which is the school, you can see they jump up from level one, which is about year four, to year five. But for the last four years of a primary school, that school's making zero improvement on those kids. Oh, yes. They're doing tougher and tougher maths problems. Oh, yes. They're using more and more complicated and complex curricula. But the kids are not learning. And this was very common in the early days of ASTOR. And we also found that the more the kids weren't learning, the higher was their attitude to the subject for a very simple reason. The teachers were giving them easy stuff and telling them they were brilliant. The trouble then, they hit high school and it was all over. They weren't that brilliant. And so bringing this together in a report, this is the report that the kids had in many schools give to the parents. It identifies the concepts in the curriculum, because we don't like using items, remember, that the kids can achieve. Given their ability, we expect them to achieve, and they did, the green box. The yellow box, the strengths. Given the items, we didn't expect them to achieve, given their overall difficulty, but they did, their strengths. The items they should have got right, given their overall difficulty, they didn't, their gaps. And the items they didn't get right, and we didn't expect them to get right to be achieved. This graph is interrogated by teachers and kids. Very proud of their strengths. Gaps are the easiest thing in the world to fix. Reteach it. The other thing is that if there's not something in each of those four boxes, the test was not a good test. The definition of a formative evaluation 
is something in those four boxes. A test that is approximately about where the kid's average is, 50% right, 50% wrong. It's actually 60% because I'm guessing. 60% right, 60% wrong is the perfect test for every kid. Other things, I won't go into the details, we can track kids' progress from year four to year 10, and we can see their progression. The most used web page in New Zealand for 20 years is the what next. Teachers are very good at coming up with lessons, but how do you pitch them at the challenge just above where the kid is, the plus one notion? How do you make sure you don't choose a lesson plan that covers the ability ranges of all kids so the kids can do what they could do yesterday? We want to increase the challenge. And this is where the curriculum comes back in. And this whole model then helps inform the teacher about whether their concept of their judgments about the students are right, the challenge is right, and whether they're actually effectively teaching the curriculum. And so this is the model of national testing. And the government now has the biggest database on the abilities of kids over 10, 10 years. Well, it's over 20 years now. They actually used it recently to look at the effects of COVID. And they didn't just look at the effects of COVID in 2020 compared to the previous years. They looked at it for the previous 20 years. And it was, once again, like the five meta-analysis on COVID, the effect side of COVID was trivially small, which upsets and surprises many people. But that's another story. And this is why my lingering passion in psychometrics is about score reporting. How do you come up with optimal reports? And we've spent a lot of time coming up. And it's interesting, the next volume of educational measurement that comes out, it's about very soon, for the first time, has a chapter by Ron Hamilton, who recently passed away, and April Zaneski, looking at score reporting. And I would argue, for those of you in measurement, this is the place we should start. Not finish, we should start. We should stop devising all those little reports and then blame teachers and kids who they don't understand them. That's our fault as psychometricians. My sixth chance meeting. And this happened 1976. My first AERA meeting. And at the time, this gentleman was 31. He'd written the basic standard textbook and statistics and education, but he also invented a thing called meta-analysis, Gene Glass. And I was a bit mesmerized sitting there as this young graduate student listening to this person talking about matter analysis. And the two examples he used was the effects of class size and the effects of psychotherapy. And I went to my first job and Armadale talked about this thing called matter analysis. And Brian Hansford said to me, well, the best way to learn about a matter analysis is why don't we do one? So we did. And we had the luxury of hunting around for a topic. And by chance, we chose the relationship between self-concept and achievement. And so we published one of the very first meta-analyses. And over the years, I did a few more of these things. And then I had that e sort of epiphanal moment where I was saying, how can we get a better understanding of what expertise is? How do we get a better understanding of what impacts teachers are making in classrooms? What happens if I could do a meta-analysis of meta-analyses? So I started, and in the first publication in the 1980s, I had 134 of these things. Not enough, but start. And so my hobby has been collecting matter analyses. And when I was in New Zealand, I thought, I'm not going to talk about it anymore because I want to talk about my love and measurement. But what I'll do is I'll write up, because I had about 800 of that stage, I'll write up my story. And it took me about 15 years to write the story because it was about explanation. Michael Scriven sitting there. What's the explanation? It's not just data, John. It's about the interpretation of data. And I really, really struggled with trying to come up with the explanation about why these influences had an above average effect on kids' learning compared to those that had a below average, below average effect. And every new meta analysis that came out was another Popperian challenge that I might be wrong. And sometimes my theories were wrong and I had to throw them out and start again. And meta-analysis has emerged, it's a very, very simple notion, made incredibly complex by some psychometricians. Talk about heterodiety and fixed random effects and away they go. 
not unimportant, but it's basically about the average effect, the magnitude, and about the moderators, the variance. The fact that I struggle to find any moderators to the visible learning story, again, is upsetting to many, but I think it's a fascinating one. Not that we shouldn't keep looking for them, but it's really interesting. And in the last 10 years, it's taken over my career. Uh, next month, March the 20th, the sequel. I didn't call it the second edition because it's going to look quite different. I now have 21 2100 meta analyses. I've got a new gauge, a temperature gauge. <laughs> and I have to point out it's for a very simple reason. Those of you know the barometer. If I'd used the barometer with the 350 influence, it was 120 extra pages. So I got Janet to come up with a different one. So hence the thermometer or the temperature gauge. And I've now published, I'm embarrassed to say, 60 books on visible learning, and it's kind of taken over my career. But my message to you today is it's all firmly based on chance encounters and what I'd argue is good measurement. And my aim is to change the questions we ask. And that's what I think is the essence of being an academic. How do we change the questions? I'm not interested in teaching. I don't care how people teach. I care about the impact of teaching. All what works is a nonsense phrase because virtually everything works. What works best? and so on down that list. And I encourage you, as you go about all your work, is to go back and say, my biggest contribution to this area was changing the question. And if Herb Marshall was doing a similar presentation, he's been a genius at changing the question that we look at, at Big Fish, Little Pond, and many of the other things we do. Whereas previous to that, other people had other explanations and other questions they were doing. The distribution of effects. You can see there's hardly anything that we do to kids that are in the red zone below zero. And most of them down there make perfect sense. Bullying has an effect size minus 0.3, boredom minus 0.4. Virtually everything we do enhances kids' learning. And I have 400 million kids in my sample size. I should point out that those 400 million kids is all, are all in one Excel spreadsheet which isn't that big actually, but that's another story. But it's that explanation behind that blue zone and teachers and schools in that blue zone compared to the yellow zone. But here's the other message. Look at that blue zone. What keeps me going in my work now is I get to move around the world and I see so much expertise. There's a lot of teachers, there's a lot of schools doing a stunning job. You'd never know it from the rhetoric. You'd never know it from the politicians or the public. And often you'll never know it from the academics who always want to pull someone down so they can replace them with themselves. I think the most fascinating question in our business is not failure, but success. The thing that I find fascinating is there's hardly any research in our literature on how we scale up success. We're very good at dealing with failure, and we should be esteemed for that. But we're hopeless at scaling up success. We often put it down to the individual. Oh, she's a really good teacher. Well, we have plenty of them. But we also have teachers in that yellow zone. And that's one of the unfinished parts of my business is how do we scale up success? And I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail and visible learning that keeps me going. We're running our program now in about 10,000 schools around the world at any one time looking at how we scale up success. We're getting there, but every time a principle changes, we go back to square one. How do you get away from the whole dialogue of stress and burnout and look at coping strategies, which the psych literature moved back in the 1980s? They don't care about stress anymore. They care about the coping strategies, but we're still obsessed with the wrong thing. That notion of learning, from a kid's point of view, classroom's about learning, not about teaching. But most don't have a language of learning. Most don't have a, even measures of learning. We just released a free website on the Hattie Family Foundation of a measure of learning. Looking at the work Herb's trying to do, the student evaluation at high schools, moving away and get teachers to move away to look at what it means to be a student in the classroom. 
this notion of collective efficacy and student capabilities and that graph that I have up there changed my thinking dramatically. That's the graph of the employment rate in the US since 1980. And if you look at that graph, it's no surprise that high content area, high social skills are very employable and the opposite not. But look in the middle. Students that have lower content and higher social skills are employable, but those with higher content and lower social skills are not. Employers are asking for communicators, team players, and translators now. But when you go into most schools, kids sit in groups and work alone. High stakes assessments are done by individuals. Our system is not mirroring. I don't care about what's happening in the 22nd century. I don't care about the future. I care about now. We're not looking at that teaching of that collaboration. And I ask you, particularly those graduate students, you're going to learn more, more from those collaborations you have. And we need to treasure that. And I'm very proud of the book I have up there we published last year because I wrote my first book with my son on visible learning for parents. And as some of you know, I've moved into the more into the policy space with Aitzel as the chair of the board of, of Aitzel now for 10 years. I get to meet ministers and director generals. And I don't know. Can you guess how many ministers and director generals I've met across Australia in the 10 years I've been doing this job? 65. We change them a lot. We're very up and down in this business. But my constant thread has been minister. It's about expertise. It's about building expertise. And what I'm doing in New South Wales, I hope is if it works, when it works, will be a front runner for many other states to bring that expertise out to the fore, which parents saw during COVID in buckets and spades. But the biggest, the biggest hindrance to expertise in our business is the profession itself. And that's what needs to change. And yes, we're working in our family foundation, giving back across the world and looking at other ways that we can support graduate students to move forward. As I'm in this lovely, as you see with my title back at the beginning here, Herb, the keyword is emeritus, which is the fancy word to say, we want you to keep working, but we don't want to pay you retirement. And so my argument today is about chance meetings. And I must finish on the most important chance meeting, meeting Janet. I have to confess, like Herb, I married a student. And it's been the best chance meeting I've ever had. And we're growing our family now. And Janet still working. She's a professor of evaluation, second professor of evaluation in the world following Michael Scriven. And she is my best critic. Oh dear, Herb knows her well. She doesn't mince words and she tells you exactly what it's like. And again, that's one of her best attributes. She's a wonderfully good critic. She criticizes the ideas, not the person. She criticizes in ways that helps you go, well, maybe that is a falsification and I need to start thinking again. Have many chance meetings in your careers. Take those as opportunities. Find that critic amongst your team and those are going to be your best academic friends for your life. They are rare. They don't happen very often. But that's what keeps you going, is someone who can question, who can falsify, who can make that difference. That's my theme today, folks. If I can learn how to get out and get back to the system. Oh, damn. Have I stopped sharing? Yes. So over to you. When we said you could, uh, you could do whatever you want. Now uh, uh, there's lots of local speculation as to what that was going to be, and everybody assumed that it was going to be uh, uh, the latest and newest in visible learning. And I said, yeah, John will give you some surprises. He's got quite a few uh, tricks up his back. So wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, for me, it tripped down memory lane. Uh, we've crossed hashed cross paths so many different times and so many different people. Uh, I think I mentioned that Michael Scriven was an undergraduate counselor of mine at Indiana University and Rod McDonald, somebody I've worked with. So it's lovely to hear that. And 
thank you for the message. Thank you for a really clear message. Now, why don't I turn it over to local people or if there's uh, uh, people that want to put something in the uh, uh, box to, uh, to John to uh, talk about, that would be great. So I have a question, but it's very practical. It's not so much about the research itself. It was super interesting, and thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, so it looks like you've got the government's ear, and uh, I would really like that too. And um, so I'm going to come up front because you can't. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a bit so echoey. You. Uh, it looks like you have the government's ear, and I want that too. And um, so. I know you say your meetings were of chance, but lots of them were based on you probably already been having like some a standing. So they know you, they know what you do. So that's why you met some of them. Um, and is that what you use or do you leverage that mostly to get the government to listen to you? Or what kind of resources do you use to best sell your ideas? Like, because you know how we're going away from traditional funding, writing grants in our academic way. And when I, I want to pitch to the government, how do I best do that? What's the what's the trick? What's are there any resources, any lessons learned? Well, look, there absolutely is. And I think the first thing is to start from the premise that every politician I've ever met truly wants to do a good thing. Now, the fact they do some stupid things and silly things is another part of it, but they don't work from the premise. And it's interesting when you sit on the side of the, the minister, which I've done in many, many meetings, and see educators and researchers coming to them. And the first thing that educators and researchers tell the minister is how bonkers the minister is, how mad they are. Why are you wasting your money on this? That? They are so negative. Now, I've not met a minister yet who doesn't know the research in this area. They do. They get so many briefs. I know the current minister, he is an incredible sopper up of research and he knows it. And so people walk in the room with him and assume he knows nothing. That's the first mistake. That they want to be on your side and you want to be on their side. They also want, don't want to hear, I, I do this. If it doesn't work in 10,000 schools, they don't want to know. And so many people go to them with a simple answer. I tried this and I worked in these schools and it worked here. No, did it work in 10 schools? Did it work in 50 schools? And it's a very, very, very rare encounter for a person, an educator to go to a minister and even have something work in two schools, let alone 20 or 10,000. They want, they're interested in scaling up. They also are sick and tired of people coming to them with an idea without evidence. Except war stories. This is what I did. Most ministers hate case studies with a passion. Some of them ban case studies. They see it as truck methodology. You bring up a truck of case studies and you pour them out. Now, there's nothing wrong with case studies as a measurement person. But from a policy point of view, it's not about case studies. It's about scaling. They also know that the biggest problem in our business is not ideas. It's the implementation of ideas. How well is it going to be implemented? It may be implemented well in one school, but not in another school. The other thing that I learned is they all have a policy brief. And if you don't know the policy brief, when you walk into that room, you're not speaking the minister's language. And so you're coming up to an election at the moment, the, the various parties have put out their policy pitches. If they win, that's their mandate. That's their blueprint. The art is getting into the policy. Australia is about to come up with the new national standard um, uh, the NSRA, that drives the whole system. We've just gone through four years of one with 10 parts to it. And if you don't know the 10 parts, you're not on the political table. Quite frankly, the Productivity Commission two weeks ago released a report proving that all by one, they failed. No one wants to do that again. So that's the current discussion at the moment. Are you part of the NSRA? And you know, given the kind of work you're doing, particularly around um, you know, the the positive psychology, the all the stuff, it's hot topic. And so now's the time to get in and talk about how do we get onto the NSRA table? Because does anyone know how much money is spent on schools in Australia each year? Each year, we spend 
$89 billion. Why don't you be part of the solution? It's plenty of money. Wow, Australia, any country is actually, don't quote me on this and don't record this, we're swimming in money in schools compared to other places. I'm not going to say it's equity distributed and all that kind of stuff, but relative to other countries, money isn't our problem. It's choosing the right things to spend the money on that makes the difference to the lives of the kids. So for where you sit, um, I think collectively, talking to politicians, inviting them to come along to your sessions, but do your homework before they come. They're not walking into your room with a blank slate. They also have a problem. Share their problem. Thank you. John, let me ask you a question. How are you going to translate expertise into reward? Yeah, when the minister, actually the premier came up with rewarding excellence and he talked to me and said, would I be involved? And he said, what do you think? And I said, minister, the, the biggest problem is those two words. Um, it smells and thinks and talks like performance pay, which has never worked in the schooling system. And so he allowed us to change it slightly to rewarding excellence and teaching. Um, but it was enough. It was a bit of a tough start because it's not about performance pay. Look, I think the answer is very, very simple. And I learned it from National Board. You turn it on its head. The first thing you do is you say, we're not going to reward teaching because we don't care how you teach. We're going to reward the impact of teaching. And here's the best thing to do. We're going to ask you to put a case forward. As all you in academia, you have to put a case forward to be promoted. And is there a template? Yeah, there kind of is. Is it prescriptive? Not really. And having read hundreds, if not thousands, of promotion applications, the variance is the norm. And there are lots of ways that we can put forward evidence of us having our impact. And we talk about it all the time. And we even have impact measures. And we go out there and say, when we're junior, which impact measures punish the junior staff, there are other ways that we're building a career. And we can build very convincing cases right through from becoming a tutor to a senior tutor. Why aren't we doing that in schools? So why aren't we saying, here are the parameters? We do it for highly accomplished and lead teachers. We do it in national board. It's been very successful. John Wang in Singapore, you're doing it in your school system uh, very successfully. And we can learn a lot about that, how we get the teachers to put up evidence. Now, our current whole system is incredibly onerous in what it asks for. Very onerous, embarrassingly onerous. And your state has already worked on reducing that onerous nature. So it's not a random event. You don't have to guess what you have to put in. So I think when you turn it on its head and uh, say that, how do we help teachers evidence their impact? Teachers often aren't very good at evidencing their impact. They've moved on because they got the next class. This, I think, is a fundamental role of universities. And I've talked to people in your school, I've talked to people in lots of different universities saying, don't help teachers get through halts, help them evidence their impact. I think it can be done. So that's my argument. I think the measurement of it's very high. Once again, we work backwards. We got national standards. We know what they look like. They've been agreed to across the country now for 10 years. How do you then work back to evidence impact to those standards? Other people? Any of our international or uh, online people have uh, further questions? Or ponderings or queries? Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, what a tough act to follow. Uh, I, I'm glad we've got the best uh, to start off our new series. And thank you so much for accepting the invitation. And thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.